but to anybody um, who wanted them at, uh, at, at accessible prices. Um, but uh, a lot of people want in on, well, let's see. Okay, new era, <laughs> mass production, sorry about that. Henry Ford's largely responsible for that, okay? But the fact is, by about 1927, housing starts are down, uh, construction is down, retail inventories are starting to grow, consumer credit is increasingly maxed out, and markets for the big new things have matured. That may be a more modern term, but when a where there's a market for something new on the market. So there's new out there, sales will be brisk. Eventually they're gonna level off. At that point, the market is matured because it shifts from a market dominated by first time buyers to a market dominated by replacement buyers. And so the uptrend stops and it levels up. Nobody knew to expect that. So people have this impression that the, the high Dow Jones average means the whole economy is prosperous. 1929 through the first two thirds of the year was being hailed as the miracle year on Wall Street. The Dow Jones was up, outperforming all uh, possible expectations. On the Friday before Labor Day weekend, in early September 1929, the Dow Jones average closed at an all time high record that would not be equaled again until 1955, 26 years later. Now today it's around 30,000, but this dizzying height, 1929, 452, okay. All right, then after Labor Day, it begins to trend downward. By trending, it's always a jagged thing, up, up, down, up, down, a little more down than up. Ner Some investors get nervous and bail, others are hanging on, all the financial gurus say, it's okay, market, market's gonna find uh, uh, firmer footing and we'll resume the meteoric rise but it's just not getting better. Now there's something about the downtrend that's worth our attention. And that's something called selling short. As I tell my students, when you're college age, at some point, some well-intentioned adult will look you in the eye and tell you very earnestly, don't sell yourself short. What they mean by that is don't underestimate your personal potential. That's good advice, but it has absolutely nothing to do with what that term means on Wall Street. Okay. Selling short is a way you can, it, it's a form of gambling, but you can, if you get lucky, profit from a decline in the price of a share of stock. Okay. The brokerage would lend you stock from their portfolio, sell it in your name, credit your account with what comes in, deducting a fee, of course. Then within the next three days, they'll go back into the market and buy the stock to replace what they lent you and charge your account for that. Now, if the price has gone down in the interim, you pocket the difference. If it's gone up, <laughs> you could be in trouble. That happened within the last couple of weeks on a company. Now, what happens as the market starts to trend downward is the big boys, insurance companies, pension funds are engaging in massive short sales. And when they dump that much stock, what's it gonna do? It's gonna go down. It's a sure thing. The problem is the small investors are getting crunched like bugs. Okay, about the last third of October, this thing gets completely out of control. Uh, the market would open, sell orders would flood in, the big investment banks would send their men onto the trading floor, just buy everything, get hold of, just to stop the slide. And after about two or three days of this, they're out of bullets. And I believe it was October 29th, 1929, Black Thursday, I should have checked that. It, it's completely out of control. Uh, sell orders coming from everywhere, pandemonium. They had a machine called a ticker tape machine. This little tape strip goes through it. It's supposed to give you an up to the minute record of, of transactions on the market. It's running in three hours behind. There was a, a entertainment industry publication called Variety. Their headline the next day was Wall Street lays an egg. That's a term for a play that goes bust after one day. So that's the starting gun. Did this cause the depression? The answer to that is no. We've had other stock market crashes. The one in 1929 ranks no higher than third all time. I think the record is October 19th, 1987. But we didn't have a depression. We have a depression this time because uh, of the uh, weaknesses in three major components. 
importance of the economy, specifically agriculture, manufacturing, and banking. You say, well, hey, what else is there? That is just about it. Now, economists would say all three of these markets are in disequilibrium. Equilibrium is where quantity supplied equals quantity demanded. It's a function of price. So no product is left gathering dust on the shelves. No customers are waving their dollars, but there's nothing there for them. It clears. Now, uh, the type of disequilibrium we have here is excess quantity supplied, okay? More stuff for sale than can, customers are willing to buy at the price. Normally, this works itself out because uh, sellers will have to cut the price to move the product and manufacturers um, will move out of that market because it's not as profitable as it was. That didn't happen like it was supposed to, but what you have here is, is a huge shakeout that only the strong survived. Okay. Um, let's start with agriculture because farmers had been in a depression for, for pretty much the whole 1920s. Uh, the family farm paradigm still held sway and a healthy double digit percent of Americans were engaged in agriculture. But uh, the problem started during World War I when we're feeding our population, our four million man army, European populations, farmers could sell all they could raise at unbelievably high prices. So the temptation is to borrow money and increase production, which at that time meant pretty much bringing new land into cultivation. Okay, now they estimate their ability to repay those loans based on market conditions as they were in 1917 or 1918. Then the war ends rather abruptly and unexpectedly. Europe's agricultural production become returns to normal over two or three years and farm prices, meaning the prices farmers get when they sell their crops, begin to sag. It doesn't just roll off the table. It just sags year by year by year, putting the farmer in a terrible bind especially those who owe money. Their debt payments don't go down, but what they get for their crops does. Now, no farmer, no agribusiness concern has anywhere near enough market share to make a difference, okay? If car sales slow down, the car makers slow down production. They stabilize price by limiting supply. Farmers can't do that. They have only one option, and that is to try to increase production to make up the difference, from the, you know, com compensate for the fall in price. And so when tens of millions of farmers all do that at the same time, <laughs> what's going to happen? It makes the problem worse. And the problem is uh, oversupplying the market so that as prices fall toward equilibrium, they drop below the minimum necessary to keep all those farmers farming. Even the ones who don't owe money are still in trouble and some of them go into debt. Now, most of the time, farmers can't just increase production because they want to. They've only got so much land. There's so many hours of the day. Uh, but the 1920s has a unique factor never seen before or since. The farmer mechanizes his operation. Okay. Henry Ford began uh, manufacturing uh, popularly priced tractors running on internal combustion engines in 1916. The war gets in the way of that. But here we go. But 1920, about one American farmer in 50 owned a tractor. 10 years later, if you don't have a tractor, you're not in business anymore. The farmer goes to town, signs some papers to the bank, buys himself a tractor. What does that do? That makes it possible for him to cultivate far more land than before. There's a whole other thing here. He'd been using horse-drawn cultivators. He doesn't need the draft horses anymore. <clears throat> so he gets rid of the draft horses and he's been using sometimes as much as 40% of his land to raise fodder for the draft horses. Well, he didn't have horses to feed. So that land goes into production of the money crop as well. So markets become, excuse me, incredibly glutted. Um, there's really no way out of this. All right, let's see here. Uh, I'll turn the page. Manufacturing will be great. In the 1920s, Henry Ford's moving assembly line mass production techniques are being uh, uh, implemented all across the industrial sector. 
but not Henry Ford's other theory. Henry Ford has very little education of any kind, certainly not in, not in economics, but he seems to have grasped something a whole generation of economists and industrialists missed, simply this, that mass production will require mass markets. If you can produce all this stuff and more and more stuff all the time, who's gonna buy it? Somebody's gotta be able to buy it. So, um, Manufacturing, as I say, looks great, but there are two what I call time bombs sticking away that are going to implode the economy. This is a tiny bit technical. Productivity increases outstrip wage increases. Wages went up in the 1920s. They trended up about 30% across the economy in real dollars. It wasn't enough. With all this much more <coughs> efficient new factory equipment, by the way, Production is how much you produce. Productivity is outputs per unit of input. How much of that, you divide the number of workers into the number of products, there you go. That goes up faster than wage increases. So manufacturers were still hung up on the paradigm that labor is a cost to be contained. Ford sensed that unless the worker is paid enough to make him a consumer, they're not going to be enough consumers. And this plane is going to crash. I don't think you would have thought that in those words, but there you go. Okay, so you have that going on. Plus, uh, manufacturing concerns became very cash rich by charging higher prices than they should have. <clears throat> they don't have to go to the bank. That blunts some tools the Fed could have used, but they often plowed their profits into new, bigger, far more efficient factories because they assume this is gonna keep going forever. It is a sort of a brave new world. The, the uh, huge markets that await them in the 30s, they got to be ready. So they build these big factories. And then what happens when things start to go down, as they will, when the markets mature, et cetera? This big factory has to be run at a high percentage of its capacity, or the overhead costs will simply be prohibitive. You can't run this at 10 or 20 or 30 percent of capacity because it simply costs too much just to turn lights on. So then um, when the economy falters in the late 90s, inventories begin to rise. That means more stuff's coming in the back door than going out the front. Factory orders are cut back. Uh, uh, <coughs> factory owners uh, either cut wages or turn, turn workers loose altogether. Um, Sometimes someone just kept running full out, thinking, well, somebody can buy it someday. So that market becomes grossly oversupplied. Okay. Um, so it's kind of a vicious cycle here. The more prices go down, the more workers lose their jobs, the more consumer demand slacks off, the more products, the more orders get canceled, the more workers get laid off. There you go. And that's just one slice of the economy. Okay. Meanwhile, the, the boards of directors, the CEOs of these companies got, they had the idea that if they cut the prices of their products, that would be, uh, that wouldn't be honorable. That would be a sign of defeat when that's what they should have done. That's what they have to do. So they use terms like we will hold the line on prices. Yeah, I charge whatever you want to, it's not enough people to pay that price or some, not enough. Okay. So the impact here is swift and brutal. The crash takes out consumer confidence. Far fewer people are willing or able to buy on credit. And you know, how long would Jerry Chevrolet stay in business if it only sold the cash customers? You get the idea. So unemployment begins to, uh, to go up from the crash. For the next three years, workers are laid off at an average rate of 100,000 a week for three years. Okay, banking, I'm running low on time here. The United States has always had more banks per capita, that doesn't sound too funny, than other industrialized countries. In the 1980s, the DFW Metroplex had more banks than France did. Now, it was worse 100 years ago, okay? At the end of the 1920s, and there's 7,000 bank figures in the prosperous 20s, uh, the U.S. had upwards of half again as many banks as it does today with only a third of the population. 
So credit is going to be oversupplied. Okay. Banks make money through something called the interest differential. That's the difference between the interest rate they pay on money they borrow for, you know, savings accounts, that sort of thing, and what they charge to uh, to borrowers. Okay. They they pay interest to their depositors. They collect interest from the borrowers. Now it's a hyper competitive environment. They're really in economics, you can say there's too much of something if there's not enough businesses, not enough business out there. The traffic will not bear enough to keep them all afloat. And that's what happens here. So the interest differential is narrowed, narrowed, narrowed. You have to try to offer to pay a little bit more for people's savings accounts, charge a little bit less for interest, and there you go. Banks tended to be um, often poorly managed and lightly regulated and deposits were not insured. If the local bank should fail with your money in it, your money's gone. Maybe not permanently, but it's not going to be accessible to you. The bank will go into receivership. The receivers are auditors who will sort out the assets and liabilities. If there's anything left over, they'll share it out pro rata among those who have a claim. You may get pennies on the dollar someday. Meanwhile, you can't pay your bills. And the people you can't pay your bills to can't pay their bills. So a single bank failure has catastrophic ripple effects across the local economy. Anyway, <clears throat> we start to see what they call bank runs. And they call them that because if the rumor spreads, and it might be true and it might not, that the local bank was in trouble, people literally run down the street, fight, claw, and <laughs> climb over each other to get to the teller's window to get their money out before the bank is dead, before it goes down. Okay, and banks only keep a small percent of their reserves on hand as cash. <laughs> if I had time, I'd tell you that just stupid bonehead mistake the Federal Reserve Open Market Committee made. They, they could have softened a whole lot of this, and they didn't because they thought these bank failures were a good thing. It's criming out the undergrowth so the big trees can flourish more. That metaphor will work. Okay. So we start to see thousands of bank failures. By 1932, the entire banking system is nearing total collapse. If that should happen, we're like the old lady in the commercial who's fallen and can't get up. So we have weaknesses in three major sectors of the economy. Okay. Uh, as an index of the overall event, the statistics tell part of the tale. The Dow Jones average set its all-time high 452 just before the decline began. And in about two and a half months, it lost roughly 50% of its value. 50% of the money invested in securities was gone. Then it began a slow recovery. So high for the year to end of the year close was down about 40%. That's a lot. By the way, this gradual increase is something in more recent times known as a dead cat bounce. <laughs> I don't know why, but I had a student got mad at me one time. He assured me very seriously that dead cats do not bounce. <laughs> okay, dude, have it your way. How exactly, how exactly did you come to find that out? <laughs> but then stop there. The market continues to decline through all of 1930, all of 1931 and about half of 1932. Now you got the 452 in your mind? July 8th, 1932, the Dow Jones average closed at 58. It's lost 90%. Then it begins a slow comeback. It's a jagged comeback, but it never got that low again. Now, in market economics like this, it's not so much where you are, it's which direction you're heading. There are purists who insist that that was the end of the depression because after that, we're making the comeback for the time being. Okay. The gross domestic product, that's the estimated dollar value of the entire output of the economy for a year. Now, these are microscopic figures in today's dollars, but they're much more then. Uh, in 1929, even with the crash happening near the end, gross domestic product was $109 billion. In 1932, which was the low point of the Depression, it was $56 billion. It shrunk by about half. This is as good a time as any to put this in. But if you watch movies about this, sometimes you get the impression the whole economy is just gone, flat as a pancake. 
not really so it's still there it's still functioning new cars are being made and sold some of the trains are running uh, most people do still have their jobs it is just shrunk it's shrunk to a smaller size leaving a whole bunch of people out in the cold okay uh, manufacturing uh, in 1932 the manufacturing output of the country was 54 percent of what it had been three years earlier that's big several major railroad companies went out of business because uh there just wasn't enough stuff being shipped anymore um let's see um, unemployment has always been virtually impossible to accurately ascertain much is misunderstood about that today uh to put this in perspective since world war ii began nearly 80 years ago unemployment in this country has tended to fluctuate over a very narrow range five percent is low and theoretically about as low as it could get and you should note a year ago it was like three percent some people took exception to that i have no idea why um the highest it's been it only hit 10 percent twice until last spring when it got up to 16 percent which was approaching depression conditions is back down to about six now <laughs> unemployment is reckoned to have been somewhere between 25 and 30 percent at the depth of the depression about 1932 okay just turn that over to well you know 70 to 75 percent of the workers still had their jobs they did but they've got some serious you know worries and hopelessness that sort of thing okay uh, now, it's the effect is regional. The impact is regional. The manufacturing sector is concentrated in the northeastern quadrant. It's where the bulk of the population lived as well. That's east of the Mississippi River, north of the Ohio River. And there, they would have wished for 30% unemployment. Ohio, big industrial state, uh, in certain cities, unemployment could run as high as 80%. Poster child might be a moderate sized steel mill town in Pennsylvania. Denora, Pennsylvania has nearly 14,000 workers living there. And we're told only 277 of them had jobs to go to. Okay. So uh, this, is, this is catastrophic. Now in rural areas like the South and the West, like Texas, for example, which remained an overwhelmingly rural state until World War II, which transformed us in the blink of an eye to an industrial state. Times were slow and prices tended to be low, but farmers can always, you know, raise beans and potatoes and eat them, shoot a squirrel every now and then. Uh, I'm told it tastes like chicken. I don't remember. I think I've eaten squirrel <laughs> when I was a kid. I didn't know squirrels are rats with bushy tails. They're rodents. Okay, so so this this leaves a huge impact. Now, 1932 to be about early 1937, there's a recovery by 1936. We're almost back to where we fell from, and then um, we barely flopped again. So I see I have a question. We'll we'll finish this up. I have 11 and a half minutes to present. The emotional and psychological consequences cannot be reduced to statistics. We don't have stats on those, but very safe to say a sense of hopelessness and despair settles across the land. Except if you were rich enough to shrug it off, John F. Kennedy later reported that all he knew about the depression was what he read in the papers. People like him. Now, out of work men took a very heavy hit because in the culture of that time, the man went to work, had the job, supported the family, the wife kept the house, raised the kids. Okay, a man's whole sense of, of identity and self-worth and self-respect was bound up in his ability to provide for his family. If he just can't do that anymore, he, his manhood is gone. A lot of men just abandoned their families, rode the rails. If a man's wife works, that was a deep humiliation because that calls into question his ability to provide for his family. So there you go. Among intellectuals, the notion took root that uh, capitalism had failed. Karl Marx had got it right all along. So that plants some seeds as well. Actually, well, I've got more time left than I thought. 
what the Federal Reserve could have done. It was fairly newly established. Um, the Federal Reserve then and now engages in something called open market operations. Once a month, the Federal Reserve Open Market Committee convenes in the Federal Reserve Bank of New York City. Now, virtually all banks, commercial banks, they are businesses set up during a profit. They invest some of their reserves in federal securities, that is, they buy federal bonds. The money that's tied up in that is only counted in the most comprehensive measurement of the money supply because it lacks liquidity of any kind. So if the Federal Reserve Open Market Committee needs to um, keep, keep a, um, an expansion, economic expansion for becoming inflationary, they can offer to sell securities to the banks uh, with a little extra interest uh, incentive built in. That reduces the lendable reserves and kind of takes your foot off the gas. What is happening here, though, is that banks desperately need to have more cash on hand so they can survive a run. So what the Fed should have done in retrospect is offer to buy securities from the banks with some interest incentive built in. And that would have given them armed many of that could have saved no telling how many hundreds, if not thousands of bank failures. Did they do it? No, they didn't. Fog of battle. They have no understanding of what's going on. They thought inflation was the threat. Plus, it doesn't bother them that these little podunk country banks go out of business. They're just concerned about the big banks. Why does that not surprise us? Okay. I see I have a question. Um, I'll click on the thing here and see what happens. This is new. Okay. Um, was there any talk at the time of government intervention in the market, similar so-called bailouts? I'm going to answer this live. The question was whether uh, government should uh, just pay money to poor people so they wouldn't starve. That was very controversial. The president, when this started, was Herbert Hoover, who, who tended to look at things in a very long perspective. And uh, his beliefs about economics were typical of those of educated men of his time. He's not different. It was assumed that they already knew about the four phases of the business cycle, that this is going to work itself out over time. If you start just handing out money, one, you create a possibly permanent class of under underclass of people dependent on the government um, and you'll never you'll never be able to undo that so you pay a long-term consequence for trying to fix something that would fix itself anyway and European countries followed pretty much what Hoover would have done and they're out of this by the mid-30s we are still in it when World War II comes along now Herbert Hoover political uh mythology notwithstanding, ended up using federal power in the economy more vigorously by far than any previous president had ever done. This was not our first major economic downturn. We had a serious depression in the 1890s. We had actually five, they didn't call them that, five such things in the, in the 1800s. Okay. So there are some conservatives who uh, put uh, that if they don't like FDR or Hoover, Hoover either one, or two peas in a pod. Does that answer your question? But as far as just a, a bailout so-called businesses, there wasn't really talk of that. Um, in 1931, Congress set up something called the Reconstruction Finance Corporation, which would make large sums of federal money available to be borrowed. They put it in the big banks. They could borrow money from the big banks to you know, expand, build stuff that they thought would increase employment. Okay. It, that They kept that around until after the depression was over. All right. Anything else? I had no idea I could get through this, this, this length of time. A rapid romp through the Great Depression. Yes, sir. We have another question. Sure. How do you answer those who blame capitalism for the depression? Okay. Capitalism could be credited for prosperity. With socialism, you just have a depression wall to wall. It's never done anything else. And it's modern advocates say, well, it, it would be democratic. We'll do it right. It's never been done right. 
it always drifts toward authoritarianism. And, uh, you know, in 25 years ago, in um, um, the country of South America, whose name I can't think of immediately, they were first world. They were the, like the third largest market for new Ford F-150s in the Western hemisphere. They're oil rich. They elected a socialist and now they're doing without toilet paper, screaming about two meals a day, getting their drinking water from mud puddles and there's nothing they can do about it. It's almost impossible to roll this back. As far as capitalism, I think this is, uh, it's the fact that you have a, you're in uncharted territory. There'd never been a situation like this with, uh, with um, um, mass production out there really for the first time. Uh, nobody really understood the consequences of, uh, of things that were done. They're still going on an, on an outmoded model. So, um, uh, and mistakes were made along the way. The Federal Reserve declining to use uh, open market operations. So uh, that's the best I can do on that. I've thought about doing a, a session which I would entitle, Why Not Socialism? To which I would propose to give an answer to that question. May not do it. Any other questions? Uh, oh, we have another question. Oh, well, I see the same question. Uh, let's see. Uh, I have a question on, would you, some of the things you were describing uh, on the, uh, about the, the people borrowing money or, or taking their life savings or whatever, just to buy stock, uh, would that be similar to what was going on in the, in the dot-com bubble of the 1990s? Uh, yeah, well, okay. Sometimes, sometimes there'll be the sort of mass psychology thing where uh, prices of a particular kind of stock or stocks in general will, will go up and lose touch with reality. You would think that, that let's say, of a corporation with X number of uh, common shares out there circulating around, if you multiplied the, the price per share by the number of shares, you should get a number roughly equivalent to the value of the company. When that gets out of hand, you have a bubble. Bubbles do one thing, they pop. Now, what was different about the 30s was people going out on a limb, okay? You inherited 10 grand. Your broker says, why don't we put that in ABC Petroleum? So we'll do a margin transaction. You buy $100,000 worth of ABC, you owe 90 grand. That's okay. If it goes up to 150, and they were doing that in the, in the 20s, you sell out, you got roughly a 500% capital gain. That's not chopped liver. I'd say don't try this at home. Uh, however, if it turns around and starts downward, if the price, if the value of the stock that you bought with borrowed money goes below what you owe on it, the lender can issue something called a margin call, and you got to reach in your pocket and make up the difference right then, right there. And a lot of people simply could not, could not do that. But yes, their market bubbles from time to time, and. Uh, we should have learned something in the last 90 years about safeguards to put in place for that. And um, they've, gener they've generally worked. It took the Federal Reserve generations to figure out more or less what their role was and what mistakes not to make. But uh, hopefully we're there now. Of course, now we're in a hyper political era. When I was a kid, politics were peripheral. Now it seems to be everything. That's a mistake in itself. Any other questions? Did I answer that? Anybody out there? We have a question. What was the effect of the New Deal programs? The New Deal, again, uncharted territory. They tend to be making this up as it went along. It got caught up in what I call political mythology. It did some good, but not as much as hoped. I happen to believe from my study of history that government's power to improve things is severely limited. All they can do is stir things around, help some by hurting others. To get farm prices up to where you know farmers will keep farming, uh, the Agricultural Adjustment Administration, it has the effect of making groceries more expensive for people who are starving. But you have to have farmers farming. 
I'd say the one thing, the one thing that did good without doing harm was setting up the Federal Deposit Insurance Corporation, the FDIC. That, at a critical moment, stabilized uh, public confidence in the banking system. Without that, we, we, would, we wouldn't, might not have recovered even now. Uh, but you have that. The, the, uh, what they tried to do with industry, it didn't really work. Uh, you have some improvement. Uh, so my timer's going off, telling me that my time is up. Okay, you got the late night talk show. You got the host sitting at the desk there and he's grinning and you got the guest over on the divan and they're grinning. And the host is looking past the guest over to stage right or whatever it is. And here comes the death angel, the grim reaper with the scythe and the bony end. And the guest says, <clears throat> well, folks, I see our time is just about up. <laughs> Any other questions? Did I leave you hanging? Uh, I uh, I think that that is it. Okay. I'll see the Grim Reaper. All right. Well, here I am. Uh, so Grim Reaper. <laughs> I appreciate everyone coming out, and thank you, Professor uh, Wells, for for your excellent and interesting discussion on the Great Depression and why it happened. Thank you very much. <laughs>